In today's video, I'm going to be taking you through the wide belt sander that I've got here in the workshop. I'm fairly new to wide belt sanders. I bought this a couple of years ago and that was my introduction to them. I knew nothing about them before I bought one. I was very lucky to have a friend that is quite knowledgeable on the ins and outs of the machines and he's taught me through everything I should look for when going to look at and buy one of these things. So I thought I'd do a similar thing for you guys if you don't happen to know someone that has a machine and you want to look at seeing whether one of these would work for you then hopefully this is the video that should help you out. The model I have here in the workshop is the SCM Sandia Uno. The Uno means that it's just a single belt. Now wide belt sanders are available in multiple belts so you can have a, a really coarse belt at the start of your sanding process and then further belts of progressively finer grit to achieve a really good finish and a lot of material removal in a single pass. I've not got that facility because I don't have the space in the workshop. I opted for this machine because it has a really compact footprint and it's the only way I was going to have a wide belt sander was if it fitted in this tiny little space here and I could put it on casters and wheel it out when I wanted to use it. So where do I start with something like this? This is a machine that I knew nothing about. I didn't have one of these during my apprenticeship and buying the machine was my first introduction to wide belt sanders and it's quite, a, quite an experience really. There's a lot to learn about them. I had some really good help and advice from people online specifically my friend Ben and I'll pop a link below actually he's got a YouTube channel he doesn't put much on there but he's also got quite an active Instagram and he's a really really talented guy. So the basic concept of the machine is we've got a big belt inside here and it runs it spins around the belt or the sanding action is towards you so when it's cutting the wood the abrasive belt is running towards the feed of the workpiece. The longer the belt the better because it keeps the sandpaper cooler. Just see, yeah, there's more abrasive there to work the material. This is what a belt looks like off the machine. Just a big loop of paper. And it's quite handy for once it's, once it's got a stripe in it like this, it's kind of ruined. But they're quite handy to keep hold of and make other things out of because it's just a big sheet of sandpaper. Belts for this specific one are around 20 quid a belt. So they're not too expensive, but you don't want to be pushing something through the first time through a new belt and either ripping it or putting a big burn mark in it. The basic concept of it is we've got a moving bed, this is generally like a rubber that the timber sits on. The timber is fed through on the belt, it hits this sprung bar here, there's just a gentle spring on that and it's full width of the bed and that holds the material down to that, that bed surface so it allows it to, to feed it through and pull it through. And then the first wheel it hits is the big rubber wheel with the air grooves in it. So this is like the main feed wheel and, and does the bulk of the work. It's rubber coated and you've got to be careful if you're going to buy one of these that you just check that all the way along that it's not had something damage the belt and damage that wheel because it's quite common for them to have a ridge in it or something and you'll never get good flat sanding results from a machine where that wheel is damaged. So good point to check is that that rubber wheel is nice and clean and straight. Once it's gone past that one, there's what's called a sanding pad. Now not all machines feature this pad, but it's basically takes any wobbles out from any movement as the piece of wood goes through. There's all sorts of variations of how this pad system works on all the different sanders. It's a pretty simple concept, try not to get too confused or worried about it. A lot of them are, are air pressure applied and this one is just a really simple alteration. So as we turn this lever here, you can see the pad moving up and down. Adding a bit of pressure onto the sandpaper that hits the material and it's a graphite pad that pushes on the back of the sandpaper. And basically what that's doing is spreading the pressure. So you, you're trying to get like a finer finish from the belt. So a wheel when it sands against the workpiece is point loading the belt. So if you get any sort of slight movement or, or wobble or as it feeds in it slightly lifts, where the wheel is sanding it, at that point you get like a, a wobble and you finish. Whereas if you introduce some pad onto the abrasive belt, then it's, it's traveling over sort of 30 mil worth of width. And that pad is actually just smoothing out everything that's happening within the machine and you get a much finer finish on the actual material. So hopefully you can see in these couple of clips, pushing a piece of material through without the leather padding gauge, it's point loading that front wheel. And this is for 
your, your bulk material removal. Your first few passes through to get the item pretty much near flat is going to be on this setting and then when you, you've got it and you want to push it through and get that final nice finish from the belt sander, you engage the pad, it flattens the belt out across the workpiece and you do a very fine pass that should give a much better finish. But you don't want to leave the pad engaged for any amount of material removal because it just adds extra heat into the belt and it's not going to last as long. So that's why that facility is there because you can get a better finish and you can save your belt as, a bit as well. And then the final roller is a back roller. It's just getting the belt flat so that the, the pad can be applied. And then behind that last roller, we've got another sprung roller that again, keeps it held down to the bed so that uh, there's a little bit of mechanical pressure there to, to keep everything nice and level as it runs through. While we're in here, there's a few other little bits to show you. We've got all sorts of stops on it. There's loads of devices that you need to make sure are in the right position for the machine to actually start up. This is one to, for the belt tracking. If the belt tracks too far this way, there's a safety switch there that will stop it once you stop the machine from turning to stop the belt completely coming off the end and destroying itself. There's a pull button here, which releases the air pressure. And that allows you, when it's turned on, basically when the air pressure's on, you don't have to go to the other end of the machine to stop the air. You can pull it here and it drops the air pressure on the belt and allows you to change the belt without turning absolutely everything off. Yeah, you remove this plate here, I'll show you that in a bit, changing the belt. There's actually quite a lot of info to get across with these machines, so I'm not really sure how much to, to divulge to keep the video sort of a reasonable length. If you've got a more specific question that I've not covered, then just pop it in the comments and I'll get back to you. I've put this on wheels, it's quite a heavy machine. I do need to sort the wheel setup out because it's a very temporary affair to get it up and running in the workshop, but it does work and they're pretty substantial wheels to be honest, so I'll pop a link to them in the description box below. So having a look in this end of the machine, this is kind of like the business end. This is a real old bit of kit and there's still quite a lot of electronics on it. You've got electric motor driving the belt, and the feed to the conveyor belt and then you've got air power or, or pneumatic power that tensions the belt and sorts the tracking out. The tracking on the belt is basically this top whole section of top roller which the belt runs around can move back and forwards. Now this is set up so that there's always a constant bit of movement in the tracking of that belt so when it's in its natural position it tries to push the belt off the end of the roller and there's a, an air sensor or it's like a jet of air into a little cup once that jet of air is revealed so the belt has gone past it and it hits the cup it then activates this air ram here so it pushes the roller and alters the tracking and then it brings it back until that jet of air basically is covered by the belt then it reverts back to tracking off the end of the belt again So there's quite a high demand of air for this particular model. The older ones, I think, use a lot more air than newer models. I think some of the newer ones, or even some of the older ones, operate that tracking system with an electronic mechanism. I'm not 100% sure, I've got zero experience of that, so there'll be someone in the comments, hopefully, that can clear a bit of that info up. This machine uses a lot of air because there is a constant jet of air being fired at the belt and it's quite a high demand on the compressor so if you're looking at buying one of these you just want to check that your compressor is up to the job and can provide that amount of airflow. Other than that there's not really a lot going on this end you literally open this door to turn the air on and off and, and that's about it. One thing I did do for a few times when I first got the machine I wrecked a few belts and that's when I was putting the belts on the little bar there right in the center of the screen I'd quite often push the belt on and if the fold in the belt where it sat in the box happened to loop around the outside of that so if the belt got 
on the outside of this bar here. You'd not notice it as you put the belt on from the other side. You'd start it up and it'd rip this half of the belt off of the machine. And I couldn't work out what was causing it because obviously once it's been ripped off, there's no evidence of what's done it. Um, so just watch out for that one if you've got a similar thing and you put a belt on. It all looks pretty much all right once you do it. And then, uh, yeah, it rips your belts to bits. So that's cost me a few quid learning that little mistake. Oh, when I got it as well, the top roller bearing was absolutely knackered. There was a knocking amount of play in it. You could lift it up and down. So the shaft on the end of the roller was completely like it had been hammered. So I got my brother to actually machine that down. Made a sleeve for the end of the shaft and then we got some new bearings and replaced them. So it's running sweet as a nut now. I think I might have a little bit of footage of him milling that down that I saved at the time. That was about a year ago now, so I might not have saved that. So we've got the electric motor underneath in this back cabinet here that drives the actual main head and the main sanding head. But the feed belt is driven by this motor here through this gearbox that's on the side of the bed. Pretty common arrangement and I think these gearboxes and motors are pretty readily available. One thing to look out for when you're buying one of these second hand is that the belt is in good condition on this bed because they are not cheap. So you kind of want to look for how much adjustment is left on the ends of the roller, see if it can still actually tension the belt or whether this belt has stretched beyond being tensioned properly. Because at that point, it won't drive anymore. It'll, it'll slip when there's workpiece on there and not push anything through because there's no tension on the belt. So look for that and look for any cuts or damage or bumps in the belt. The general consensus is that they tend to just run to one side of the thing. So I was quite concerned for a start that it seemed to want to run this way all the while and I assume you can adjust the tracking. I've played about a little bit with the tension on these rollers to try and get it to track slightly more in the middle on this belt but I've not achieved it yet. It seems to always want to run one side or the other. And then dust extraction. The dust extraction is incredible. There's literally not an ounce of dust comes out of this machine when it's on which I was really surprised about. I thought there would just be plumes of dust chucking out of it. And that is, of course, if you remember to open the vent gate on the extraction system. Now I've got this plumbed into my normal extractor. It does go outside to a separate shed. So the explosion risk, I think, is not as much of a concern as if it was in the same shed or building as the actual sander. You want to run these ideally to an explosion proof extractor. And that's because of the amount of dust you're creating. If dust particles get to a certain concentration, it can spontaneously combust. So if you then say sanded a small piece of metal that produced some sparks and it got into that dust that was at the perfect concentration, then it's quite likely that there could be an explosion. Kind of want to know what you're doing with that. I've not had any trouble yet. And I don't actually know of anyone that's ever had an extractor exploded. It's best to just maintain your dust extraction equipment, keep it as dust free as you can and clean it down every so often. And like your ductwork in your roof and your in all your pipe work, just check it, make sure it's not getting a, a layer of fine dust built up all the while and that could then dislodge one day and cause an issue. So just make sure everything's nice and clean periodically. And I think you should be all right. So let's get into how to turn it on and then how to use it. So like I showed you on the other end, we turn on the air pressure for a start. We need to make sure that all the stop mechanisms are basically disengaged. So there's quite a few things that could stop this from physically turning on. There's an on off switch here that illuminates green when the 
motor can be started. So this button won't actually turn the motors on, it just turns the machine on. And then this is your start stop switch for your motor. There's a star and a delta symbol on here. Uh, that's for startup purposes. So you flick it to the first setting, which I think is star formation on the motor. And that allows the motor to slowly build up to speed, you know, and, and, and build up its momentum without putting too much load through the electrics. And then once it's actually running and up to speed, flick it to delta and that gives it the full beans. If you leave it in the first setting and try and sand it, you really see the amps on the amp meter start to climb up and someone's put a line on 20 and whether that's what their electrics could take I don't know but I've, I've seen this just go right up when I forgot to turn it round to the delta setting. Probably not good for the machine but uh, it seemed to take it so maybe a good test that our electrics are all right but yeah we've got star and delta on that so i turn the machine on that'll tell you it won't illuminate green if any of the stop devices are engaged to, to stop the machine from running and then you turn the motor on with this one and then you've got fast and slow on the feed belt or the conveyor belt drive for your workpiece going back to the start the start procedure with them switches that could prevent it from starting we've got a lock on just push button switch there like a safety switch so if you're this side of the machine and you've got a problem you can stop that there quite often you'll see a foot switch got the same thing on the start button so you've got to make sure that one is open too and then on the front of the machine this entire red bar here is a big stop switch so if that gets triggered either by you pressing it or a piece of wood that is basically you set the machine too high and it's going to take too thick of a cut off that just basically rides back with the piece of wood and cuts the machine out it immediately stops the bed drive and then the the sanding belt just runs down at its normal speed like i mentioned before the machine needs air power in order to operate so this is a air pressure sensor switch and that again is linked to the electronics so if it's not got the appropriate air pressure to run it won't physically let you turn it on and the same goes at the other end of the machine with the change belt button so if that's activated with the pressure off on the belt then you can't physically turn the machine back on so that needs to be pushed in with pressure on the belt to engage and there's a couple of sensors on the belt like I mentioned before so if these are triggered for any reason then again the machine will either cut out or not physically turn itself on once you've made sure all of them hurdles are jumped and you think you're ready to go there's one more thing that caught me out so if you raise the bed up too high or goes right down to the bottom limit switch it cuts out the electrics as well so that's kind of like a it must be a safety thing for the feed on the bed and that caught me out so probably worth knowing if you're looking at one of these that's that that's another thing that will crop you up and stop the machine from turning on now unfortunately the air pressure has to be on in order to turn it on at all so i can't really work around and show you how these things work without the air pressure buzzing away and it makes a horrific noise so with the green light on and the motor's not turned on so nothing's running just the machine is turned on we can then adjust the height of the the feed bed so how thick we're going to be sanding to a finish that is adjusted by this lever here or this turn knob and that electronically adjusts up and down the rise and fall of the bed and the height that we're sanding at is displayed on this dial down here and there's also a hand thumb turn which you can fine adjust your height so you can you can literally dial that into sort of 0.01 of a millimeter if you need to i recently made some really wide draw boxes which couldn't fit through the planar thicknesser so i planed them up on this or, or sanded them down with the 40 grit belt and i was taking probably half a mil off in some passes on 400 wide oak tried to do it across grain or or feed it in diagonally if possible and it, it tends to cut an awful lot better than if it's running with the grain but yeah you can really take some material off if you've got the right belt in that rise and fall screw thread is on four acme screws and they're connected underneath in the frame of the machine with a, like a drive chain and all go up and down at the same time so you get a nice parallel rise and fall now this machine doesn't have one but quite a lot of wide belt sanders will have a pad on the side of the the infeed bed somewhere here and that's linked to the rise and fall mechanism so you, you take a, a component of what you're sanding say a, a sash frame and you sit it on this pad 
and then the machine adjusts and basically a sensor adjusts the height of the bed until it touches the piece that you're going to be sanding and that, that just sets the height of the bed automatically for you so you can then adjust how much you want to take off and push it through without any guesswork or measuring involved in setting the height of the bed so it's another thing that will work for you. I've not gone for that with this, I wanted the, the smallest and most simple machine. Like I say, it's my first one, so I'm learning on the job. And I've not got a lot of space. When I've got this in the workshop, this machine has literally got to be pushed right back to the wall and the bed lowered down to about 80 mil of thickness for me to be able to use my spindle moulder at full length capacity. So I didn't want anything sticking out or extra on the beds of this machine. And equally, that's why I've not got any in-feed rollers. So you quite often see these for sale with the extended in-feed rollers, which would be really, really handy because they stop any tilting of the work, especially bigger items like a full-size door. It's dead easy to, to drop the, the door as it comes out and exits the machine and you sand a bit too much off the end of the door. So they would be really handy, but like I say, I'm a little bit limited with the size of the workshop. I can't physically fit them on and have it located where it is. So unfortunately, I've not got them on this machine. Take you through the startup process, dust extraction on, turn the air on, make sure the green light on the control panel, which means everything's okay. And we turn the drive lever for the motor on the belt to that first setting, let the amps drop back down to a, a reasonable amount, then flick it to the delta setting on the motor and that means we've got full power for sanding. So here's just a couple of clips from previous videos of me with the belt sander being used in anger and it really is a good tool to have in the workshop. I mean we didn't have one of these and I always thought you know they weren't that necessary but I definitely wouldn't be without one now. It is an absolutely brilliant tool. I can't remember exactly what I paid for this but I think it was about two grand which isn't a lot of money for, for the amount of work it does now in the workshop. And I can't stress enough, like I just said, how much I wouldn't be without it. It's, it's just a brilliant tool, especially as I got it just as I was doing that curved cabinet. So if you've not watched that video, go and check it out. But it was really useful for flattening off veneers and getting a, a really calibrated thin piece of wood for, for me to be able to do that laminating and that curved work. So it's already paid for in my opinion, and I've no doubt got many years of use out of this particular machine ahead of me. One last thing before I go is the abrasive belts and I'm using the Merca Jepu Flex. Seem pretty reasonable on price, about 20 quid a piece. I've got three different grits at the minute. 40 grit and I've used that for basically planing anything that I can't put through the, the uh, planer thicknesser. So then wide drawers it's perfect. I could take rough sawn timber and you could do about half a mil at a pass and plane a really wide board down with 40 grit paper, which worked tremendously. I've got a 120 grit, which is pretty much always in the machine. Just great for general sanding, calibrating and flattening. And it's perfect for then going after with like a 180 grit orbital sander and you've got your finish on your woodwork. So that's predominantly what will be in the machine is a 120 grit paper. Now I've got some 240 grit for finishing as well. So on them drawers, all my drawer boxes I made I run everything through with the 240 grit, taking about half or 0 .01, 0 0.05 of a mil per pass off with the 240 grit. I had to be really careful on the oak to stop it from heating up too much and, and burning into the paper. So it's quite a slow operation, but on, the, on a big job like them draw boxes, it saved me quite a lot of sanding actually to push them through three or four times with a, a tiny amount of removed each time got a really nice finish and barely had to touch them with any hand sander so it's worthwhile having the a finer sandpaper but I'll, you have to be dead dead careful with it in terms of stopping it from getting these lines in so this is one that i've actually it's gone through a bit of a grain where it's caught some resin and it's burnt a line into the actual paper and that bit of the sandpaper you, you can try and remove it with like your rubber pads you can get these sticks that are like uh a rubberized material and it's like a belt sander cleaner and it, it does get it out sometimes but once it's burnt in and it's gone black like that that's uh pretty much you don't use that bit of the belt anymore that's done for so um, just be dead careful with this the finer papers are really handy if you're sanding something like glazing bars in a, a big sash with loads of little great glazing bars in 
because you've got a cross grain action on the sandpaper so the finer grit doesn't tend to tear the grain across when you're sanding across the grain on a rail. So quite handy for intricate stuff like that but uh, yeah you just need to choose your paper and uh, and make the most of, of what you got. In order to change the belt itself we come to the left hand side of the machine and we undo this bracket here. This basically fixed the, this side of the sanding head so once this is removed this whole head and all these rollers are floating hanging off the other side of the machine so it's really important to put that back before you start sanding again. To remove that I like to remove the pad get that out of the way it's another thing to snag on the belt as you pull it out that gives clear access to the end of the belt have to sort of get it past all sorts of little bits of metal that try and catch the edge of the belt it's really important that we don't tear this edge because it makes it a weak spot and uh, it's going to fail prematurely basically and we can just slide that completely out this end To get the belt back on is basically the reversal of removal. So the tricky bit, I'll try and film it. You have to hook the belt on the top of the top wheel here. Get it so it sits on there, but then position it so it gets past all the rollers and metal at the bottom. And that's why I find it's easiest to remove the pad because once that, it's another thing that basically sticks down and can snag the edge of the belt. But you don't want to force this. If, there's a, if it's not going on, just stop and have a look why it's not going on and find out uh, which bit needs moving and it will go on really easily. Push that on so it goes past the end stop. Make sure that's not activated. Then basically put this frame on the end. There's a little cammed it's like a top hat washer with some flats machined on it and the top hat washer goes through the, the hole and then the flats obviously engage in the flats in the bed and stops it from turning so that you can tighten a nut and then there's a small amount of adjustment via these grub screws here that are locked off to calibrate your left and right thickness on your machining head against the bed so it's a fine amount of adjustment there if it's 0.1 of a mil thicker this side than that one you'd wind them screws up a touch and as it clamps it down it gets it in exactly the right thickness and the pad just slides in this little groove here Like I mentioned before, there's directional arrows on the actual belt itself and the, the rotation of the belt is against the feed drive of the conveyor belt. I hope you enjoyed this one. It's not my normal format video. I'll try and keep uploading the joinery stuff and doing these tool reviews in between as well. YouTube seems to really hammer the channel down and, and just knock it off the radar if you don't put a video on every week, which is just wrong in my opinion. I think you should put videos on that are a quality and if it takes longer than a, a few days or a week to upload a video it shouldn't really damage your channel's performance based on you're not regularly uploading it should be about the quality of the content on there not just clickbait but uh, that's what we're working with and it's free for you guys so uh, you can't really complain can we but there we go that's my walk around tour of the wide belt like i say any other questions drop them down below and I will get back to you. I just wish that when I was looking to buy one of these that someone had done a video exactly like this and just gone through a, a walk around of it, a few things to look out for and, uh, and just yeah, a bit more in-depth explanation on the machine. So if you're in that situation with another machine then uh, let me know and if we've got one in the workshop I'll do the same sort of video on that machine and uh, hopefully help you out with uh, something that you're going to buy.